and we are going to go to Judges chapter 6. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Well, let me go from verse 1, because this is the reason why they were under such oppression. Mm -hmm. All right. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Whoa, that's a long trial to be under. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed and increased of the earth until, the, till thou come into Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord, your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah. Oprah that pertained unto Joash, the Abizrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now you know he was hiding from the Midianites, so he wasn't quite what you call a mighty man of valor. He was a scared man. He was fearful. All right. Hmm. All right. So, verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, or you might want to call it your passion, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Let me say this to you. This is what I want to say to you. <laughs> Sometimes God's got his hand on you at your weakest moment. I'm going to let you hang on that one for a minute. Verse 15. And he said unto him, Lo, my Lord, wherein shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely, I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Let me say this to you. Some of you feel like you're at the bottom. Some of you feel like Satan's got his foot all in your face, all on your head. You feel like he's the head and you're the tail. No, the word says you are the head and not the tail. And you have to tell yourself that sometimes. Sometimes when you are the most fearful, sometimes when you're at the bottom of your game, when you feel like all is lost and woe is me, and you feel like all hell is breaking loose in your life, in your heart, that everything is working against you, you feel the oppression of the enemy all on top of you, and you just can't figure out how to get out of this mess. You can't figure out what to do. 
You can't figure out what to say. You can't figure out how to fix it. You can't figure out what the problem is. What's it all about, Alfie? And there are times when God will catch you right at your weakest moment, your most broken time. And he will begin to work miracles in your life. He will use you in ways. That's what the Bible means when it says one of the meanings of my, the Lord's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Midian, I mean, Gideon was feeling weak. Gideon was feeling like the least likely to succeed. Gideon was feeling like the one who was on the loser end, the, the one who got the short end of the stick, came from a family that was jacked up. And here he is, he sees himself as toe up from the flow up. I just love that expression, so let me wear it out. So what you end up doing is you have a man who is discouraged, who is downtrodden, who is scared, who is hurting, who is discouraged, who is disheartened. He doesn't know what to do. He's at his wit's end. But guess what? That's the one God called. Ain't that something? He didn't go for the strongest man of valor in the group. He didn't go for the one that had the high hopes and the strongest faith. No, he went to the one that looked like he was withering to nothing. There are times when you're at the back door of your game. You're at the bottom of the barrel. And God will pull you up right at that moment and say, I got something for you to do. That's why when you're going through hell, it's a good time to ask God, what do you want me to do with my life? What calling do you have for me? Because whatever you go through, whatever trial you go through, whatever hurt you go through, let me share this with you, baby cakes. It is all a deposit into your calling into your giftings, into the ways God wants to use you. Not one experience, not one moment of shame, not one moment of loss is a loss. It all adds up to how God's going to use you. It culminates and shapes and molds you like we were talking about how Jesus does as a carpenter. He tears down, he rebuilds, he constructs, he reconstructs, he fixes things. Let me tell you, whatever's going on in your life, not one experience, not one failure, not one shameful moment has been wasted. God will use everything if you allow him to. When he's ready to use you in the way he chooses, you will find that not one of these experiences will be wasted. Some of the biggest failures I experienced in my life, God uses my failures that I had to learn from straight from the hand of God. And I counsel other people from my failures. My father used to tell me, you know, Patty, if I go down the road, our family could almost mouth it when he was telling it. He said it so many times. When I go down the road and I see there's a pothole on blah, blah, blah street. And I tell you, don't go down that street because there's a big pothole and your whole car could fall into it. But you go down that street anyway. I warned you. But the reason I warned you is because I came across that pothole myself. So I know it's there. I'm not talking about something I read. I saw it with my own two eyes. See, a lot of times what God will do with you is he will use your failures, your potholes, your losses, your, your brokenness, your areas of crippleness, your, your your crazy mindset and sometimes we wonder if we're if we're sane or insane because some of the of the cuckoo stuff we do some of the crazy choices we make we wonder if we're grown or if we're still a little child on a grown-up's body because of the areas of our immaturity the areas where we have ceased to develop or we are slow in development 
we are we feel like the developmentally disabled <laughs> but what god says is no matter what is going on no matter what is going wrong in your life whether it be your fault or someone else's fault or a combination of all the above or the devil's attack whatever what God will do is culminate those things. And when someone crosses your path, he'll make sure if he wants you to minister to them, it's somebody whose experience you can relate to because you've been there, you've done that, you bought the t-shirt. And you know how to circumvent the pitfalls, the potholes, the traps, the snares, the trick bags that Satan has for you. And God can use you mightily. See, that's why some of you seem like you're under attack a lot. Because Satan knows what God has imparted into your vessel. And Satan sees the mark of God on you. And yes, we carry the mark of God. Let me tell you this, y'all. Satan doesn't want to tangle with you. No. He don't want to mess with you. Sometimes when you feel like you're at your weakest, you feel like, who would be afraid of me? I don't have anything going on with me. Well, listen, let me share this real quick. Years ago, when I, I had some prophets prophesying over me, we fasted. These were prophets for, of the presbytery. And I remember that living waters, I was at the bottom of my game. I had failed God royally. God was walking me through, counseling me every step of the way, showing me where my brokenness was, showing me where my areas of neediness were. He was really walking me through a healing path. And it felt like all the storms were raining on me while all the rest of the streets looked nice, dry, and sunny. But all the cloudiness was over my head. And I was like, what is up with this? Is this my lot in life? And, you know, battling self-pity, battling, blaming others and all of that. And God showed me when these guys prophesied over me, I was so weepy. I was so weak. I was so broken. I was so vulnerable, so discouraged, so disheartened, disgusted with myself. And this one person said, I can see you right now. The Lord gave them a vision because I was up there weeping while they were prophesying over me, still hurting while they were ministering to me. And they were talking in front of the whole church. They said, I see you. You are standing there in front of a doorway. And inside this big giant room are mad, vicious, growling dogs. And you boldly walk into the room and you rear your foot back and you kick the dogs aside. You kick them aside and they cower in your presence because of the strength God has placed in you. I wasn't feeling strong. I was like Gideon. I was scared. I was torn. I was broken. And sometimes when you feel like you're at your weakest, you're at your lowest ebb, God will prophesy strength over you. God will prophesy light and fortitude. He will prophesy power. And you know that you're not walking in power. But when God speaks it into your life, it's born. It is there. It may not have been there right before he said it. But when he speaks it into your life, it's there. And then all of a sudden, strength comes. It may not come suddenly, but all of a sudden, the process of strengthening begins. And you're no longer that little wimpy, weak nobody. When God calls you a mighty man of valor or a mighty woman of God. See, God doesn't lie. Whatever he speaks is. Just like the earth, the earth was without form and void. That means there was nothing. There was no substance. There was no matter. There was nothing solid. There was no shape. There was no rhyme or reason or rhythm. Nothing. The earth was without form and void like many of us feel. 
and darkness was on the face of the deep, like many of us feel in our spirit. And God said, he said, let there be. And let me use bad English. And there be. All of a sudden, when he said, let there be light, there was light. Huh? Light where there was no light. Why? Because he is light. So when he gets in your spirit, he lightens your darkness. He gives you strength where there is no strength. He makes a way where there is no way. He will guard you up and strengthen you on the inner man and send you in the direction he has called you to go into. You are not born without purpose. You are not born without a design. You are not born without a calling on your life. No matter what a mess you have made of your life or what a mess your life has become because of all the outside circumstances. The bottom line is you're no longer a victim, baby. You're a victor. When God says, let there be, it be. When God says, let there be, you be. You become what he says, let there be inside of you. Be encouraged. God is not a man that he should lie. And he who has begun a good work in you will perform it. What happened with Gideon? In, in chapter 7, he won the victory, didn't he? He told them Midianites up. And how did he tear him up? He didn't lift one finger. He didn't shoot one gun. He didn't send it in a bazooka. He didn't throw in one grenade. All his men lifted the light of God and the sword, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they shouted. And that's what confused the camp. And they killed each other. You don't have to worry about your enemies in life, y'all. You don't have to worry about them. If people choose to be your enemy, whether it's under the cuff, on the down low, or whether it's out there brazenly, out in the open, doesn't matter. You have nothing to fear. Psalms 27. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? <laughs> so, no. That even in your deepest moments of fear, your deepest moments of apprehension, of having no clue what God has set out for you, God has a plan. There's a song. Um, I'm going to sing part of it. Uh, don't look for a pretty voice. I ain't trying to sound cute. I want you to hear the words. Out of the fire to the flames of another trial. When you think that your heart has had all it can take and nothing is there left to break. In the heat of the fire, he will pull you through. When you don't understand it, he is tried and true. No matter the questions, there is an answer for you. So when the rain falls hard and the storm winds come and you think it will never blow over, trouble under your feet, nothing over your head, and you find yourself running for cover. Oh, God has another plan. Remember, God has another plan. Gideon hiding in the hiding all his stuff in the wine, behind the wine press. But God had another plan, didn't he? The least likely to succeed, the least likely to make a difference. That's the one at their weakest moment that God called to do his greatest work for such a time as this. Think about that. Think about that. Don't be surprised if God puts his hand on you while you're at the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Calls you a name that doesn't describe how you're feeling and then gives you an assignment. Don't be surprised. 
That's why the devil's attacking so hard. He already knows the mark of God is on you. And he's scared of you. That's right. Now, let me share this with you, show you the authority we have in God. This is a comical story. To me, it's funny because I could picture it and it looks so stupid. I love it. Listen to this. Maybe this will strengthen your faith. I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5, and, and, and you know, when the Bible calls hemorrhoids, it's talking about hemorrhoids. You know how painful hemorrhoids can be. So let's move along and tell this story. I love it. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. Doesn't it seem like, this Pat's two cents again, doesn't it seem like sometimes the enemy just takes stuff from you? Doesn't it seem like that? Yeah, here you are at the bottom of the barrel and he's still stripping you bare. He's he's picking all the meat off your bones. Won't even allow you to die in peace. That's the way it feels, I know. <clears throat> when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Uh, now Dagon was their god, their idol. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, <laughs> Dagon, check this out, picture this, the, the God, the, the you know giant idol they had erected, Dagon was falling upon his face to the earth, face down, he's fallen before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him back in his place again. Here's the comical part. Dagon was supposed to be their God, but Dagon couldn't do a doggone thing, could he? He couldn't stand up. He couldn't move. He couldn't do anything for himself. He was a helpless chunk of wood, marble, whatever they carved him out of. That's the comical part. We look to the stupid things to save us when we have God. All right. So they set him in his place again. Verse four. And when they arose early on the morrow, the next day morning, behold, Dagon, picture this, I love it, was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. That's funny. Wow. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any <laughs> that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod until this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, hemorrhoids. Hmm. even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw it was so, they said, the ark of the Lord of God of Israel shall not abide with us for his hand is sore upon us. Ouch, ouch, ouch. And upon Dagon, our God. Hmm. They still call him Dagon, their God. Dagon doesn't even have a dog on head or a dog on set of hands anymore. He's a stump. He's a stump. And they still want to refer to Dagon as their God. Is that being stuck on stupid or what? Let me ask you, for some of you who turn to other gods beside our God, who turn to Ouija boards and tarot cards and, and, and incantations and, 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 and witchcraft and, and idols and, and candles and all kind of little spells, hexes and all that mess. What you going to that crap for? You looking for the living among the dead. Any other God besides our God is dead, baby. Dead me. Dead stump. Useless. It can't get up. It can't help you. It can't deliver you. And you're looking to these gods. All these little idols. Some of y'all look to people to be your God. You think this man and that woman is going to save you. You think this job and that job is going to change your life. Baby cakes, if you ain't got it in here, you ain't got it nowhere. 
That's right. You better look to the only living God through Jesus Christ. All right. Now, this is the comical part. Picture that thing on his face. No hands, no head. And they still have the nerve to refer to that thing as their God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither, over there. That's what thither means. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great destruction. And he smoked the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emeralds out in their secret parts, in their hineys. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass as the ark of Ekron came as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to stay us and our people, to slay us and our people. So they went and gathered together all the lords of the Philip. Boy, they sent that ark away. Let me stop right there. They sent it away. You know what's sad? They were so stuck on stupid. They preferred their little stump, their little man-made idol that can't do jack for them. And they preferred that over the living God that could have healed them and delivered them in the New York Minute had they repented and chosen to follow him. Because he's merciful, he's kind, he's compassionate, but he's a God of judgment and he ain't playing. And some of us want to play with him, but he ain't playing. That's why the Bible says the beginning of the be the fear of the Lord, thank you, Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. Some of us only wise up once we really fear God because we don't want to be on his bad side. Trust me on that. So this is what we end up doing in our lives. This is for those of you who don't have the good sense God put between your ears. To follow him. He's the one that put breath in your body. He's the one that created you. He's the one that can make a difference. He can make your life a blessing or he can make your life a living hell. You choose. That's your choice. He's ready and available if you choose him. He'll choose you. But don't treat him like a Santa Claus, a sugar daddy, or a patsy. Because he ain't going to be your sucker. You have to choose to follow him humbly. You have to choose to bear fruits of holiness. You have to choose to do it his way when your flesh would want to do things your way. We don't do it perfectly, but we should be striving for perfection. Okay, I'm going to leave that right there. But the bottom line is, know that when you seek the living among the dead, and you're calling psychic hotlines and you're buying candles and oils and and, and, and and all kind of little liquids to create little spells and, and make people do what you want them to do. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of witchcraft in the body of Christ. Some of them have the nerve to call themselves Christian witches. Mm -mm. Yeah, that's like calling a demon a Christian demon. Right. See, God is not going to be played with. He will either bless you or he will bring all kind of wrath into your life. But it's based on your choices. It's not because God is a mean God. Why does he let all this evil happen in the world? Why? Because we got evil people in the world that choose to go that route. We got evil people that worship the dollar bill. So they will do human trafficking. They will sell their kids into prostitution. Whatever it takes to make that dollar bill. That's why there's evil in the world. Quit blaming God for all the nastiness that people bring into it. Quit blaming God for all the mess you put yourself into. When it blows up in your face, and trust me, 
God's been warning you every step of the way. But if you choose him, no matter what comes against you in life, God will fight your battles for you. All them little demons, they got to bow to God, baby. You got authority over them. But as long as you choose to follow your little gods, your little gods will bow to our God because he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's the head honcho in this whole picture. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Amen. You will either live a life of destiny, purpose, and calling, or you will live a life of degradation, fear, and purity hell. You choose. I hope that helps you see the difference, the contrast, the authority God has. No matter what you choose, baby, it will never override who God is. No matter who you choose to bow to, whether you pay homage to that weenie or that set of boobs, or you pay homage to that dollar bill or the one-armed bandit, whether you pay homage to Hollywood, whatever it is, to your pride, to your ego, to your flesh, whatever you're paying homage to. Trust me, baby. It'll never override or overpower the hand of the Almighty God. Choose you this day. And I hope that you choose carefully and prayerfully. God bless you. I'm going to stop there. We'll see what the Lord does for next week. Be encouraged and be strengthened by God in the power of his might. Thy mighty man and mighty woman of valor.